Okay. Okay, it's recording now. Hi everyone, uh, welcome to CNTC seminar. It's my great pleasure to introduce the uh, Cedar Perro Mesoron, associate professor from Oxford as a seminar speaker today. Uh, Cedar is a condensed matter theorist working on many different subjects, including quantum hole effect, many by localization, statistical physics, and the Moray system. He received his PhD from Princeton and was a Simon's postdoc fellow at Berkeley. Uh, he was a faculty member at UC Irvine before joining us for at 2017. And today he's going to tell us about the aceton topology and broken symmetry in the new 2D materials. Okay, please go ahead, uh, see. Okay. Uh, thanks, Yanji. So hopefully just a quick check, uh, maybe somebody can say if I'm audible at this, if I should speak louder or softer, let me know. It's always good to check that first. And second, let me say, uh, please interrupt me whenever you feel like it, you know, it's a talk that's sort of designed to be modular. So I can you know, stop at any point and uh, kind of go off on discussing any points people want to focus on. So with those things in mind, let me say thanks again very much for the invitation. I think the last time I was visiting uh, 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 Maryland, I think, uh, was back when Jed Pixley was still there. I think it was back in 2015. So it's been quite a while and it's always fun to chat with people there. Of course, I've seen many people from Maryland in the years in between. So uh, hopefully at some point in the future, I'll be able to visit again in person. So the title of my talk is on exciton topology and broken symmetry in new 2D materials. And as you'll see, this is an area, particularly in the new 2D materials part and in the first part of my talk, where members of the Maryland faculty uh, and postdocs have actually contributed quite a bit. So I'll be talking about some of their work. So hopefully uh, I've not missed anything when I do that. Um, and this is work that's mostly done in uh, the real sort of person who's been driving a lot of this was my student, Eves Kwan, um, who is a student at Oxford. Um, but one half of the work is in collaboration with my postdoc, Yi Chen Hu and co uh, colleague Steve Simon at Oxford. And that's the sort of some looking at some ideas about excitons and moray materials. And more recently, I've been working with Twitter Devakul, who's now a postdoc at MIT and also with Shivaji Sondi, uh, motivated by discussions with San Feng Wu's experiments on uh, WTE2. And so let me just give you a lightning primer on exciton condensation. This is an old field, so I'm going to not do it. I'm certainly not going to do it justice. I'm just going to summarize some of the basic ideas that I'll need for the rest of the talk. But if there are things that are uncertain there, it's probably great if people interrupt me right at the beginning so we can get the sort of ground rules straight. So, you know, in my sort of simple minded picture of exciton condensation, you know, the natural setting for thinking about this sort of physics is to think about semiconductors with a small band gap and uh, where you think about the physics of electron hole bound states. So in some sense, this is a, a relatively strong coupling approach. So you imagine having a very small band gap and you imagine there being Coulomb interactions. Hey, Sid, are, why do you need, why do you need small band gap to establish the principle? It could be any band gap. You're talking about part of your transition. Absolutely. I'm just yeah. trying to- You are I'm not talking experiments. So there is no small band gap constraint here. Fair okay. enough, Shaka. I, I, I appreciate that point. Yeah. Yes, sorry. It doesn't need to be- I, I was No, it will confuse people. Yeah. Look, I'm not trying to correct you, but it will confuse people if you emphasize small. Yeah. No, it, it doesn't need to be small. It really small. In but, reality, it may or may not happen. Absolutely, but, yeah. But your theory literally is independent of small. That's true. Yes, I mean, it is independent of small. I'm trying to put that. You're absolutely right. So I think of the formation of electron hole bound states, which are bosons, when I, out of this, in, within the gap, and if the binding energy is sufficiently large compared to the gap, then the excitons survive all the way to zero temperature. And if they have residual repulsive interactions, you can have a Bose condensation of these objects. And so that's an example of where you can have a new state of matter that arises out of a gap state. So as Shankar said, the details of whether this phase survives uh, and it is a matter of detail on exactly what happens as you go down to zero temperature, but the basic principle of electron hole bound state formation is independent of that. Fair enough? Yeah. Okay. Uh, there's also an alternative picture of exciton condensation, which you can think of as starting in the limit where you have metallic Fermi surfaces. If I have particles and holes in the system, so if I have uh, electron like and hole like bands, because I can then imagine uh, map it, doing a particle hole transformation and essentially thinking about the problem as a pair of electronic bands with effectively attractive interactions. And this looks a lot like a BCS problem where I have a reconstruction of states near the Fermi energy. So I have 
very near the Fermi surface in some kind of two band DCS problem. And so this is old physics that was discussed at length uh, back in the late 60s by Halperin and Rice in their sort of series in the condensed matter series by, uh, by edited by Sites. So this is sort of a classic problem. And what I want to focus on and uh, will be important for the rest of the talk is to think a little bit about broken symmetries in these excitonic states, because that's the place where these broken symmetries are how we diagnose exciton condensation in many, uh, many examples. So in particular, uh, unlike in superconductors, excitons are condensates of exciton insulators formed by the condensation of neutral objects. So the global charge U1 symmetry is preserved. So they don't have superflow in the conventional sense. However, there's an approximate electron hole symmetry. If you could imagine that the electrons and holes are. Sid, I have another question since yes, I'm focusing please. on what you're talking about. Yes. Uh, you are talking in a dimension independent way, which is fine because you're not yes. showing any calculation. Yes. But what dimension should I think about for the future talk? Because uh, future, think about you know, this subject I know so much about that I get I very that, upset. That, that, okay? I'm going to think about two dimensions. Today. Good. All right. Okay. I feel better already. Because if you said three dimensions, I would have been very irate. Okay, continue. No, no, I'm two dimension is good. Two dimension is good. Yeah. Two dimension is good. So in two dimensions, there's also an approximate electron hole symmetry, which is the separate conservation of electrons and holes. And if this was an exact symmetry, this would be broken in the excitonic insulator because the fact that you have this BCA in this BCS light picture is particularly clear because it's a matrix element that converts electrons to holes. And so this would give you a goldstone mode. However, this Electron hole symmetry is frequently not a microscopic symmetry unless there's some extra case. And I'll give you examples where that's a very good microscopic symmetry. But in many cases, you know, the low energy bands near the Fermi energy are quite complicated. And there's no particular reason to believe there's an exact uh, electron hole symmetry. Uh, that is, there's not separate conservation of electrons and holes. And so you might, what you expect is generically this Goldstone mode is not really a Goldstone mode associated with it. It's a weakly gap mode. So what other symmetries can you have? Well, frequently electron and hole pockets are separated in the Brillouin zone by some wave vector Q. And so in that picture, if you form an electron hole bound state, it has some definite center of mass momentum. And so those pockets separate in the wave vector, uh, separate in the Brillouin zone will have a broken translation of the wave vector that separates the pockets. And so this generically will give you density waves in either spin or charge. They'll be modulated with some period which is set by this wave vector. So there's a period of two pi over QC. And if that wave vector is incommensurate, then in principle, you can have a unpinned charge density wave with a gapless phase on mode. But very often, if the, you know, in many cases, this QC is somehow uh, related to some particular dimension of the Brillouin zone, in which case it's a commensurate wave vector, and this mode is also gap. So these are the generic modes that are present, uh, generic uh, symmetries that are broken in the exciton state. And so the thing is that finite wave vector order is fairly ubiquitous. And so whenever people present examples of an excitonic state, there's a, contra there's a question that people can ask, which is saying, how do you know that this is somehow dis distinct from some kind of Pyrrhus distortion where electron phonon interactions are playing a role rather than a purist example of where the electron electron interactions are the dominant effect in giving you the state. And so um, there are some experiments that, and so because of the fact that these symmetries are hard to capture, so there's no broken global U1, there's this electron hole U1 that's quite subtle and is frequently weakly gap, and then there's broken translation. Confirmation of the excitonic insulator phase in experiment has been somewhat elusive. And about you know, maybe five years ago or so, there was a report of exciton condensation in titanium diselenide. I'm not going to say much about this material. I just want to flag the kind of experiments that people have done to look for it. I, I don't think that the story of this experiment is fully settled. That's why I don't want to say much about it. But the argument that was given there is that uh, what they argued in, the, in that work was that um, they, looked, they did electron energy loss spectroscopy and looked at uh, what modes soften near the critical uh, near this uh, exciton insulator transition? And they argued that if you could see a uh, plasmon mode soften at the transition, then you could argue that electronic degrees of freedom that the Coulomb interaction was somehow playing a fundamental role in the exciton condensation. Whereas in contrast, if this ordering of the wave vector was due to purely due to electron phonon physics, then you would see a softening of phonon modes, but not a softening of electronic uh, uh, softening of uh, plasmon modes. So this is some older experiment. I'm going to talk to you today about a different setting, two-dimensional electron gases, where 
these kinds of experiments aren't usually done. What we're looking at are essentially, we're restricted to looking at transport experiments. I'm gonna try and talk about various transport experiments and their relation to exciton condensation. So in some sense, the best studied exciton condensate is in the quantum Hall regime, where one can think about bilayer quantum wells. So you can think about a quantum, uh, quantum Hall bilayer. So you have two layers, top, imaginatively titled top and bottom in a strong magnetic field. And you can think about the fact that every Landau level in the high magnetic field will be twofold degenerate because there's a layer index, whether the electrons are top or the bottom layer. So if you're at total filling of new total equals one, you have enough electrons to fill one Landau level, but there's a twofold degeneracy of the Landau level. And so in order to form a quantized Hall state, the phenomenon of quantum Hall ferromagnetism kicks in. Um, and you know, many of the people in the audience are experts on this. Um, in this phenomenon, you spontaneously break the interlayer U1 symmetry. And here, the interlayer U1 symmetry is the fact that uh, there's no, to a good approximation, there's no interlayer tunneling. So there's sort of independent conservation of the electrons in the two different layers. So a state that spontaneously breaks that symmetry says, consider an equal amplitude superposition of the electrons in the top and the bottom layer. There's a phase associated with that superposition. And that phase, uh, I have to pick somewhere from zero to two pi for that phase to point. So that's a phase coherent, that, that, that's the spontaneously broken U1 phase in this problem. But if I do say a particle hole transformation in the top layer, so I rewrite the problem in terms of a filled Landau level in the top layer, then the wave function can be rewritten as follows. I can rewrite the wave function as the following state on top of a filled top layer. So what I've done is do a particle hole transformation only in this layer and sort of written the same wave function with rest reference to a filled lowest Landau level on the top layer. And I get a state of this kind. And in this language, this looks very much like the picture of an exciton condensate because what I've got is a C dagger C order, just like I had promised for the exciton condensation problem. So in this picture, because the electrons in the top and the bottom layer are very, to a very good approximation conserved, there's an almost exact U1 electron hole symmetry. That is, I can do separate conservation of electrons and holes. And that actually leads to sharp experimental signatures uh, famously probed by Jim, Jim Eisenstein and others. And so for instance, you can look at interlayer tunneling and they're sort of Josephson-like signatures. In the you, should, you should really say Jan Spillman since he's a colleague here at Maryland. He's sorry, no. Everywhere else it may be Jim Eisenstein, but at least here it should be Jan Spillman. Thanks, Shankar. I forgot that Ian was the person. I'm, I'm sorry. I just, uh, that, that was an oversight. And then he's right here. <laughs> I, I, I have a question already. Yes. Uh, my question is that everything you're saying, of course, I agree with. Uh, you are saying everything correctly. But, and I don't know where you're going in the future. I have not followed this work. But quantum yeah. hall is very special. The whole thing about accident condensation is yeah. not the theory. Theory says it may happen. Yeah. Uh, the whole important question is, does it happen? Quantum mm -hmm. Hall is very special because in condensed matter physics, we have just two tools, right? Mean yeah. field theory and perturbation theory. And, mm -hmm. and, and the thing is that here, quantum yeah. Hall, you are very lucky because it's a gap, huge gap. Yeah. yeah. So mean field gives you basically the exact result. Well, exact meaning we know the corrections. Yeah. But in the system that you talked about before, and people always kind of conflate these two things, there yeah. is no really gap because it's a continuum. And, and you know, people have reasonable, uh, Attitude to disagree strongly whether that could happen there at all or not. So, what kind of system are we going to talk about? This quantum hall type or 2D continuum systems? Yeah. So I'm going to talk about continuum systems to a large extent. So, there is that controversy hanging over me. Well, but it's not a controversy. Argue... It's a question of whether it happens no. or not, right? I mean, yeah, uh... the question of whether it happens or not, I'm going to try and propose certain things. So, the first set of things I'm going to talk about are Moray systems, which I would argue right, are. We'll, we'll discuss it when you get there. Fine. Don't, that's okay. Yeah. Good. Continue. The second set of systems I agree are closer to titanium disulfide. So I'm going to try. The, the point I'm going to try and make is I've talked about things close to the both types of systems I'm going to talk about. So that's a fair point, okay? But it's a great question. Thank you. So the second other thing you can see is, as uh, Shankar just pointed out, in these experiments by Ian Spielman and other and uh, Jim Eisenstein and others, there's also beautiful experiments of counterflow superfluidity, which corresponds to passing oppositely directed currents in the two layers. And because that couples directly to this electron hole U1, you can actually see a version of the kind of superflow in that degree of freedom. So this is a very special situation as was flagged. So we can't expect this kind of richness all uh, everywhere. So what I'm gonna try and talk about is propose some new examples of excitonic phases. In particular, 
I'm going to talk about not about condensation of excitons, but I'm going to try and be provocative and suggest that there could be quantum Hall states of excitons in some of these Murray materials that come out of quantum Hall ferromagnetic states, but in a very different way than these exciton condensate states. And I'm also going to propose a consistency a scenario in which there is some notion of exciton order that seems to be at play in tungsten ditellurite, but this is still a very controversial material. So I'll caution that anything I'm going to say over here is speculative and it uh, relies on unreasonable faith in mean field theory. So I'm open to the fact that everything in the second part is uh, potentially you know, not correct because the experiment could do something very different. What I'm going to try and do is emphasize that the unifying physics here is to think about what happens to these exciton condensates when there's something non-trivial going on with the energy band. So after all, they're forming out of some energy bands and the recurring theme will be the to think seriously about the very phases of uh, topological aspects of the energy bands of the electrons and holes out of which the exciton condensate forms. So that will be the kind of thing I'm gonna step back and look at. So the first set of questions is gonna be specific in Moray systems. So again, this presumably needs very little introduction to this audience since you've uh, looked at your uh, recent set of talks and you've heard many of them. And I think uh, Pablo is coming to, uh, or has been there recently to tell you about the latest, so I don't need to say much. So I'm thinking about Moray graphene, where you have two graphene monolayers twisted at a very small angle. And of course, we know that now that with beautiful work of Biscuitson and McDonald and many others uh, since then, that the interlayer coupling uh, generates mini bands, which have an angular dependent dispersion. And in particular, if one focuses near a magic angle of about 1.05 degrees, you get eight. So even though this looks like just two bands, there's also a valley and a spin degeneracy. You get eight nearly flat zero energy bands. And the excitement came out of the fact that you see when the chemical, poten when the chemical potential lies within the gap, um, you have um, very interesting states such as correlated insulators. So you don't expect the system to be an ins uh, insulating because at the single particle level, it isn't. So you see an insulator that comes out of correlation effects when the chemical potential is in this, uh, within this octet. And the famous phase diagram that people draw and draw parallels, although they may or may not be justified with the cube breaks, is that you see a superconducting dome um, around certain uh, densities that correspond to commensurate densities and there's sort of asymmetries between electron and pole doping from those densities. So uh, a lot of a uh, lot of people made com uh, comparisons with the cube rates and so on. Although more recently, I think people have understood that in many ways it's better to think about this in the language of quantum hole states because that gives you uh, a better handle on things. So it's still a, a controversial area and exactly understanding the mechanism of superconductivity. So I'm going to focus on a very particular aspect of these twisted bilayers, something close to my heart, which is the thinking about quantum Hall physics in these twisted bilayers. So if you take a little bit of a wrinkle of the picture I showed you before, which is rather than take the pure twisted bilayer system, instead you place it on a hexagonal boronitrite substrate and try your best to align the graphene sheet or one of the graphene layers with the substrate. They're almost lattice matched, so you can do this alignment. And you set a filling factor nu of about three. So this is start at neutrality and almost fill the four bands above charge neutrality, leave one band empty. What people observe first in a series of experiments in David Goldhaber Gordon's group at Stanford, and then uh, sort of continued in the group of Andrea Young at uh, Santa Barbara, is that you see spontaneous time reversal breaking, which can be, which is a quantum anomalous Hall response. And indeed, when careful experiments were done by Andrea on really nice samples, you actually see a quantized anomalous Hall response with the resistivity of H over, uh, H over E squared. So quantized, something that's kind of corresponding to a churn number of one, a filled band with churn number one that forms in these systems. But there's no explicit time reversal breaking an orbit or obvious source of magnet, extrinsic magnetism in the system. You're not magnetically doping the system or anything like that. So when this first came out, there was a little bit of a mystery in where this, uh, this was, uh, where the origin of this uh, quantum quantized anomalous Hall effect. But there's actually a very beautiful mechanism that various groups gave for this, which bears a close resemblance to quanta, uh, quantum Hall ferromagnetism, and you know, where you might call it churn ferromagnetism. So the basic picture is that when you place these uh, twisted bilayer, when you place these Moray systems on a substrate and you align to the substrate, then remember this eightfold degeneracy came from Two, two spin degrees of freedom, two valley degrees of freedom. 
and a Dirac structure that you had this uh, fact that there was Dirac points in these mini Brillouin zones. The substrate actually breaks the symmetry that protects those Dirac points and gives you, uh, essentially splits you into four bands above charge neutrality and four bands below charge neutrality. And those four bands above and below have to do with spin and value. But there's a special feature that a substrate does not break time reversal. So what it does though, is give churn numbers to the bands in a manner that preserves time reversal. So time reversal swaps the values. So it swaps value K and value K bar. And so what this substrate does is tell you that, for instance, so what I've done here is use red to label churn number plus one bands and blue to label churn number minus one bands. So for instance, let's just look at one spin sector. Let's look at spin up states. If I look at this one spin sector, you see that in valley K, the churn number one bands uh, lie below the Fermi, uh, churn number minus one bands lie below the Fermi energy, uh, below charge neutrality, and the churn number plus one bands lie above charge neutrality. Applying time reversal, I switch from K to K bar, but also flip the churn number. So the assignment of positive and negative churn numbers above and below charge neutrality is reversed in the two values. The second spin is just a copy of this. So spin is just a label that goes along for the ride in this discussion. So within this picture, um, if you ask what happens at filling factor nu equals three, then essentially you can think of it as I filled all the states below charge neutrality, filled two states say in spin up above charge neutrality. And I have to then ask, where do I put the one remaining electron I need to do to get to nu equals plus three? So I have to decide which of those two, um, which of those two uh, levels do I stick it in? Or do I take it, put it in some superposition of those levels? So in this picture, uh, because the energy levels are flat, uh, you can interactions will lift the flat band degeneracy in much the same mechanism as quantum hole ferromagnets. So the argument is quite is relatively simple. You say, well, there's no essential kinetic energy cost. If I polarize all my electrons in one valley, then because of the exclusion principle, whenever two of the electrons approach each other, there must be a zero in the wave function. That makes repulsive interactions happy. Ergo, I would polarize in that state. Of course, this relies on you really being able to neglect the kinetic energy, and that's technically an approximation. There is some dispersion, but if you're in the limit where interactions are much bigger than the dispersion, this is a reasonable approximation. And uh, same, yeah. it's probably not just a dispersion issue. There are all these Absolutely. other bands also. I mean, Absolutely. this I, is I, a non-trivial question. You know, I mean, yeah. Mike and I discuss it ad nauseum. And, you know, Mike's calculation is the best calculation, as you know. Yes. You know, he had to do things about screening and so on and so forth. Absolutely, yeah. No, the I, fact I, that he knew that there is maybe an anomalous quantum hall certainly guided the work. Absolutely, it's, I don't think he would have predicted it without knowing. Right. Because it. of Absolutely. all these other bands, you know, that, that that's the issue. I mean, very yeah. similar to what happens in quantum hall also, right? If you have Absolutely. all the other lung. So it's, yeah. a, it's a tricky issue for us to uh, decisively say something quantitative. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to take, uh, Shankar, I agree with you completely. I'm going to take the point of view that this was not a prediction, but a post-diction. Right. I wouldn't dare to say it was a prediction because right. of course. And, and it may not be in all samples because it may not be, you know, in some samples, the kinetic energy maybe. So this is what is going on to some extent, I think, you know, that, yeah. that yeah. No, yeah, but but I just want to make sure you and I agree. And it sounds we like we do. That I'm throwing away the mixing, but actually I can tell you, uh, since they are here, I can say, I won't talk about it today but even something numerically as being sloppy about how you subtract your double counting, what yes. base vector you use yes. can change phase boundaries. Oh, absolutely. Boundaries. Very good. So you have thought we about those at, things. Okay. We looked at, okay. we looked at very carefully what happens to how you disorder this problem. If you imagine looking at domain walls between paramagnetic orientations and the energetics of those are way more sensitive than the gaps actually. The gaps themselves yeah. are not so sensitive, yeah. but the uh, things that you would imagine with disorder, like proliferating domains between different regions. Are yeah, I was surprised how many subtle issues there are when you did the Scarbian yeah. calculation, showing that this thing is stable. You know, yes. taking, uh, you have to worry about many, many different energetic terms and knowing the answer certainly helps. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Skirmion calculation yeah. that you did. We actually built on your Skirmion calculation. All right, continue. Uh, I, I just want, I'm just trying to make sure that you're talk I, a bit about that. I don't yeah. read anybody's paper. I don't even read my paper. I just listen to talks, okay? So, 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 so I just want to make sure that you and I agree, okay? If you like, I'm going to spend some time right after this now. Talking Please about do. The that wave. is the best time to send me something. Yeah. Then I'll read it. Okay. I'm going to talk about the wave functions that came okay. out of your calculations and analyzing them a bit. Yeah, more. Good thing is to send it to me right after your talk. When everything is fresh, then I'll look at it right away. Thank you very much. I'll tell you about this right now. So 
within uh, the- Sid, sorry, can I ask a short yeah. question? Yeah, sure. Uh, the, the argument that you just gave, the splitting of the upper and lower levels by alignment with HBN doesn't seem to be crucial. Is it crucial in a way that I'm missing? No, I don't think it's strictly crucial because the only thing I would say is that in the absence of that, I can't make a direct analogy to a churn number. In some sense, I'm generating the mass by hand in that limit. If you like, what I'm doing here is separating two scales. I'm saying the substrate assigns a direct mass that weakly splits the valleys. And then the order parameter just fills that. You could ask, suppose I didn't put in the substrate, then you would have to spontaneously generate the mass and then do that. You can do it in that limit. So a lot of this survives the limit of zero substrate, but it's more delicate. So you're absolutely right that it's not essential. I'm just telling the story because I don't want to get too complicated by worrying about that. That makes okay. sense. Thanks. Uh, Experimentally, is there any ferromagnetism without alignment with HBN? I think there's some reports. Uh, I'm not 100% sure that it's, uh, I know the most robust ones are with alignment, but I think there's some cases where there isn't. So I haven't thought about it in great detail. I think the best reports are still with alignment and everything is quite delicate. So there's lots of other things that can go wrong. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So the reason I'm also focusing on alignment is that you'll see that the phases I want to talk about sort of rely on this orbital churn insulator being a whopping stable state. And I want to build something out of this so it's like saying, if you want to look for fractional quantum ball physics, you don't want to go to a place where the integer state is controversial. You want the integer state to be well-formed and then you start worrying about fractions, if you like. So for me, I just don't want to worry too much about the integer state, if you like. Okay, okay got it, thank you. Um, and I'll come back to this point in a minute. You might say, okay, so you have this valley degree of freedom. So it turns out that the fact that one valley effectively has a positive churn number and one has a negative churn number, actually rules out inter-valley coherence in a very particular way. And I'll come back to that point. So what you really get is full valley polarization. And so what I want to focus on are excitations, neutral excitations of this ferromagnetic state. And this is something that actually two different groups at uh, two different teams at uh, Maryland looked at. So I think uh, um, Shankar and uh, one of the postdocs, I think who's no longer, who had moved on since then. Uh, and I think uh, Feng Cheng Wu, I guess. And also, um, I think uh, Jay, Jay Sao and Yaya Alvirad separately looked at these types of excitations. One looked at the spin sector and the other looked at the effect charge sector. Of yeah, we the found out that Jayadeep is looking at it when I think we submitted a poster or paper or something like that. Yeah, or, that's what you guys did. I mean, yeah. it's really like that. We I had mean, no idea. <laughs> I mean, I, I just I just viewed it as a good example of spin charge separation. So. Yes, yes, it's a good example of having a lot. Although I talk to Jayadeep like 20 times a day. You know? Yeah. So <laughs> what I'm going to do is focus on these bound states. I'm just going to give you a slightly different picture, which I'm sure is actually, I think a lot of those pictures are in common with what is stated there. So I want to think about these intervalley excitons. Uh, I'm going to call them intervalley excitons because the idea is that you've got a filled, uh, you filled uh, electrons in one valley. What you're doing is creating a hole in one, creating an electron in the other. These things have very little kinetic energy, so they have a strong tendency to bind. And so because of the Coulomb attraction. But the interesting physics here is that if I, you know, I'm talking about churn numbers. So let me step back and morally say that a churn number is, you know, morally very much like a magnetic field. So it's as though I have an electron and a pole that are sitting in Landau levels with opposite magnetic fields, which is a rather unusual thing. You don't, you'll never see that in a real electron hole system. You, you know, what you can have is an electron and a pole, um, which have an attractive interaction, but they'll always see the same magnetic field. So here you have two particles that attract each other with opposite sign of the magnetic field, which is kind of unusual. So what would be different in that case? So in a usual exciton, if you think about what happens, you have an electron and you have a hole, they both see the same magnetic field. So if you think about the Lorentz force that tries to deflect these objects, it's clear that the, if you try and move this bound state, if you try and push the bound state forward at some velocity, you see that the Lorentz force on the electron, the Lorentz force in the hole precisely cancel. So in that sense, an exit, and this is not so surprising, as a bound state, the exciton is a neutral object, so it's unaffected by magnetic field. And so that means that you can actually define a good linear momentum for an exciton. And this was observed actually by Gorkov and Zyalashinsky back in 1968, and then explored by a variety of people in the lowest Landau level limit. Uh, you know, the adaptations needed to go to the lowest Landau level. And so what this allows you to do because it's a good linear momentum is if I think of this as an object whose uh, you know, dispersion is characterized by its center of mass degrees of freedom. After all, its relative degrees of freedom will see bound state formation. The center of mass degree of freedom is just some 
you know, it's like a particle. So I can quantize this into a dispersing mode. And so that's what I see. And this was famously the, what is known uh, in many cases, the Kellen Halperin modes, for instance, in quantum Hall paramagnets, spin wave modes. But contrast it to the present example. What I have here is what I'd call a flipped exciton. So my electron uh, sees a positive magnetic field. My hole sees a magnetic field of the opposite sign. And so if you actually do the center of mass and relativistic, the uh, relative coordinates, you find that the center of mass degree of freedom is actually a, experiences a Lorentz force because both the electron and the hole experience the same deflection, they're deflected in the same direction. And so what you get is actually a charge 2e mass 2m free particle in a magnetic field. And so your exciton, instead of dispersing with the center of mass momentum, like having a good center of mass momentum, actually forms Landau levels of its own. Its relative motion is also a little bit strange. It looks like the problem of positronium in a magnetic field, if you like, because you have an electron hole bound state, but there's also a net magnetic field. So you get a very, very different set of equations for the, uh, the, for the physics of these excitons. And so, you know, just to give, convince you that this is not just a toy problem, what you can do is exactly solve, if you just take this Landau level, I'll get to more realistic things in a second, but you can actually solve the single exciton lowest Landau level problem exactly. And this is something that corresponds to solving some approximation of the beta Solfeter equation, but in the lowest Landau level basis. And you find that there's exactly flat bands of excitons, um, but you also get a quadratic spin wave. So what I've shown you here is two different things. I've shown you the difference, the blue curve is what happens when you create an excitation within the same churn number sector, where uh, within the same Landau level, within the same sign of the magnetic field. Whereas the horizontal lines are actually a series of flat levels that you get by where the particle and the hole see opposite magnetic fields. And this can be solved exactly. And in fact, you can just solve for a finite droplet and symmetric gauge and show that you get the right degeneracy. So if you have a particle of charge 2e and you count the Landau level degeneracy, you expect to see a 2n fold degeneracy for each of these steps. And you actually see that as you go to the thermodynamic limit. There are finite size effects when you solve a finite droplet, but you can convince yourself that the thermodynamic limit, you get the right degeneracy. So you basically get a picture in this flat band, highly idealized limit that you have an exciton whose center of mass experiences a two beat magnetic field of strength two beat. So this is quite a bit different than you normally expect of an exciton because you don't you expect it to be a neutral object that doesn't see it. So what I've done is here create a neutral object that sees an effective magnetic field, which is a bit puzzling and strange. So you can do some modulations beyond the idealized limit. I won't go into detail. Let me go all the way to a realistic picture. In a realistic picture, there's a lot more structure because you have you know, churn bands and you have a lattice. So to do that, you need uh, a terrible pun, but you need new ideas. So this is something that uh, you know, we thought we were doing something clever, but Chiang Yu figured it out earlier. So what you want to do is ask about what replaces the um, sort of ma effective magnetic field is what you'd like to characterize as something like a topological invariant associated with these excitonic bands. But then if you think about that a little bit, you see that an exciton is actually a two particle bound state. And so there are many contributions to its, its very curvature if you take a realistic picture. So you know it's a two particle bound state where if I work in the appropriately defined units, you are working now in momentum space and you can convince yourself it has the form that you have an electronic state at k plus q over two, a whole state at k minus q over two, and some envelope wave function. This is sort of a generic excitonic wave function, if you excitonic block wave function. And if you take this and say, let me compute the analog of a Berry curvature for this block state, and ask how does that block state evolve, you find that there are three contributions, all of which vary across the Brillouin zone in general. So for instance, you have a contribution that just comes from the fact that these individual single particle bands could have had a Berry curvature. But then this envelope function itself would have non-trivial winding as you go across the bands because that envelope function is evolving. Now, the reason you get away with something very simple in the lowest Landau level limit is that this envelope function is trivial and has no complicated behavior. But once you put on a lattice, the envelope function has some complicated structure. And then there's another piece, which is the coupling between sort of the envelope physics and the single particle states, because there's some non-trivial, if the single particle states work out in some way that pushes the envelope function some other way. And so you have no choice when you have contributions of this kind, you have to actually sit down and compute. You have to say, let me actually take the states, compute, uh, as Shankar said, it's a remarkably subtle calculation to compute the exact states, 
we're not just doing energetics. We're also trying to get exact wave functions. So it takes some work. Um, so, you know, uh, these are explicit definitions of these things which are not particularly useful. But what you have to do is actually sit down and realistically simulate twisted bilayer graphene. So what you do is do some pretty serious heart rate fog. Here we were very fortunate because there was some very nice detailed numerical analysis, as I pointed out, in the spin flip sector by Yaya and Jay and the valley slip sector by Shankar and Feng Wu. And so we could benchmark against those and we get the energetics correctly. So we have some sense that we have the right structure. We've checked against completely independent calculation. And indeed what we see is that in the spin flip sector, you have a gapless Goldstone mode with no particular uh, change. But in the valley flip sector, you see a gap degree of freedom whose energy never goes to zero. That's essentially non-dispersive. And of course you see a whole bunch of other bands because you've got all this complicated band folding going on. But what this is telling you is that this is, I think, a very nice piece of work. I think Shankar made the point in their paper that this gap is really the gap that one needs to worry about, not any other gap. This is the gap that governs the stability of this orbital churn insulator state. Because if this gap were going to zero, then you'd actually not necessarily, you, you, you'll have some fluctuations in the orbital churn insulator that you might have to worry about. And so what we played with is, what we also argued is that as you tune the substrate, you can actually see that these uh, that these two the first excited the first and second excited states can go through various phase transitions that are happening in the excited state sector. So these are phase transitions of gap excitation. So the excitation bands are reorganizing as you go. And so what you can then do is actually take this heart rate fog calculation, take its single particle wave functions, and compute their microscopic Berry curvature and find details matter. But you find that there's always significant Berry curvature across the one zone. And so this is a sketch of what the uh, energy of the ones. So this is the energetics. Of, so this is sort of sketching the contours of the dispersion. And this is the contours of the Berry curvature for two different substrate strengths. Uh, but what you find importantly is that uh, there is a substantial churn number. And in fact, if you go back when you have a relatively weak substrate, so coming back to something that Brian pointed out, in, a, in the case of a relatively weak substrate, you actually start seeing that there's actually low lying bands with significant that have a non trivial excitonic churn number. So, if you, for instance, uh, looked at energies in between these and you looked at the edge of the sample, you should expect to see uh, states traversing the boundary modes in the one exciton sector. So, neutral boundary modes that don't traverse, there's still a gap above the system, but they're sort of between two different excitation bands. There are sort of edge modes that connect them because there's topological indices of those bands, right? So that's a single particle calculation that suggests that realistically you can expect that there's significant Berry curvature and topological effects in these exciton bands. So maybe you should pause and see if there are that, that point made it across clearly. Yeah, can I go ahead? Okay. So I want to go back to the statement that I made earlier that the churn number assignment ruled out an intervalley coherent state and in favor of full valley polarization. So again, uh, I would agree with Shankar that this is one of those cases where you know the answer and you look for an explanation for why that answer is what it is, <clears throat> but it's a kind of compelling picture. So what Nick Bolting, Shubayu Chatterjee, and Mike Zalatel pointed out is that if you try to, so what I'm thinking about is I have a state where I polarize all my electrons in say, the churn number one sector. So you might ask, why don't I have an intervalley coherent superposition where I superpose electrons with churn number one with electrons with churn number minus one? What couldn't I get that? And so that state would be something like an exciton condensate because you break the U1 symmetry. If you polarize all in one valley, you don't break the U1 symmetry because it, the, the wave vector points along the easy axis. So I want to tip the wave vector to the easy plane between these two valleys, but that would give me intervalley coherence. And that would be something that corresponds to something like an exciton condensate. But because the electron and the hole see an opposite magnetic field, this picture of the exciton being uh, effectively seeing a magnetic field, you can convince yourself that that's like trying to form a superconductor in a large magnetic field. You can do that if it's a type two superconductor, but you're forced to accommodate a vortex lattice. And if you do the counting, you find that this excitonic order parameter will have two zeros of its wave function in every unit cell. That's sort of a topological requirement. But since punching those zeros in costs, has a gradient cost, this makes this intervalley coherent state energetically pretty unfavorable. And so they took a toy model where they said, let's imagine we, by hand we can tune the interaction between the valleys versus the interaction within a valley. 
And let's also imagine that we can tune the bandwidth. So this is some sort of Landau level toy model and there's a mean field argument phase diagram. But the basic picture is <coughs> um, there's not much room for this exciton vortex lattice. So you typically get a fully polarized insulator. You could, if you have enough dispersion, you basically go to a boring metallic state at a large enough uh, when the interactions are sufficiently weak. In between, you could get some partially polarized state. And to get the exciton vortex lattice, you have to sort of wander off on this axis where you really have weak intervalley interaction. And that basically tells you that the stiffness for this kind of putting these holes in is not too bad, roughly speaking. So all these are sort of mean field states that you can write down. Is it, may I ask a question? Uh, sure. uh, I mean, this is not your work, but you thought about it. But right. this is not an universal statement, right? So experimental okay. is by changing substrate, you Absolutely. know, applying gate potential and so on, may be able to modify it, right? Absolutely. This is just a very hand wavy thing. And I don't think this, act, even though I'll use it, I don't think this axis is under experimental control. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's just an arbitrary parameter. I mean, in reality, there is, you know, many parameters. Many in, parameters. Right? So I, I think, and so I, exactly. So my motivation is if there are many parameters, you shouldn't just look at the states that you can access in mean field. You should ask what other states could you might be able to get. Yeah, that's what I'm asking. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Notably, I'm going to focus over here because what this says is there's a regime where, you know, this seems always a little bit irritating to me because you're going from a fully polarized insulator straight to a partially polarized metal. So what this is saying is you'd like to be insulated, but you don't have a choice because within these trial states, the only other insulator you have has this costly exciton vortex lattice or you're fully polarized. So when we were thinking about this, I had a thought, why don't you, is there a way to get a partially polarized insulator, an insulating state that's still featureless, that doesn't necessarily have this uh, vortex lattice. So it's still translational invariant, but doesn't fully polarize me into a valley because what this kinetic energy, this is at least something I can say is that kinetic energy is saying, look, I don't want to park myself fully in one valley because that's too much of a loss of kinetic energy. I'd like to put myself partially in another valley. So heuristically, I'd like to be insulating, but I don't really want to get this state and I don't want to be here. So what could be another state? So if we go back to this idealized picture of excitons being charged to bosons in a magnetic field, well, I know another set of states for bosons in a magnetic field. Bosons in a magnetic field can actually form quantum Hall states. And so what these would be, would be excitonic quantum Hall states. So they're quantized Hall states of bosons. So what I'm doing is forming this excitonic object and the exciton can't Bose condense, but at a dilute density of them could actually form bosonic quantum Hall states. And people have proposed these states, for instance, in rotating, uh, rotating Bose uh, rotating uh, ultra cold atoms, uh, bosonic traps. So um, or in fact, in optical lattices that just Ian Spielman has generated. People have talked a lot about bosonic quantum Hall states. So what would this mean? So let me do the same thing, exactly the same thing that uh, Mike Zalatel did, which is tune the interaction. So I've got this model where these two layers are the same as uh, my two valleys. And what I'm gonna do is by hand say that the interaction between valleys is different. So the intra interlayer interaction is stronger than the intralayer interaction. That's fine for layers. It's probably a terrible life for valleys, but I'm just gonna do it on the justification that other people do it, so I'm allowed to do it. But it's, you know, keep that in mind that it's not the most physical of things to do. But let's take Chunker's comment that there are lots of axes so we can play around with some axes and worry about the physical realization a bit later. At least with this kind of tuning, you can convince yourself that if you have a sufficiently large tuning parameter, the exciton exciton interaction is quite large. And since the exciton number is like a valley polarization, it's a conserved quantum number. So what I've got is a set of bosons with a conserved quantum number, repulsive interactions that effectively see a magnetic field. And so at some finite density, I can form incompressible fractional quantum Hall states. Now, of course, to do this seriously, I have to actually take a microscopic model, do it numerically and see what happens. But I can just, I'm just asking what would the phenomenology of such a state be? because simulating these things is very difficult. We're trying to do it, but the only real way to do this is to do DMRG on these system sizes. We've done preliminary exact diagonalization, but that's not the easiest thing to uh, stay. Uh, at least for these bilayers, it's not the most useful thing to do. It's putting in a dispersion is tricky. So let me imagine a finite density delta. So this delta you should think about as a valley polarization. Remember I said, I'm trying to get between fully valley polarized insulator and partially valley polarized metal, what I want to get is a partially valley polarized insulator. And so the valley polarization, when delta is zero, I'm fully valley polarized. I'm transferring delta electrons per Landau level or per band from 
the filled states to the empty states, so from one valley to the next. In this language, the effective filling factor of the bosons is two delta, and that's because of the way their charge is. Because they're doubly charged objects, they have twice the Landau level, uh, they have the, the different Landau level degeneracy. If you do that calculation, then you can actually write down a type of state that actually was written down by Bert Halper in many years ago, which is you can take a Laughlin, a Laughlin wave function of electrons, a Laughlin wave function of holes, and do what I'll call exciton projection, which just says, slave it so that every time I see an electron and every electron here, wave function, every whole wave function should be paired with some short range correlated thing, which is like the wave function of the exciton bound state, right? And if M is even, this is actually a non-trivial wave function because if M were even, this would not be a valid Laughlin state in any layer independently. So it would be incompressible if you found it in any individual layer because it's not a valid electronic wave function on its own. So it requires this condensation to be a valid wave function because this wave function carries all the anti-symmetrization that you need to get things to work. And the preliminary numerics I allude to is just the statement that you can play around with exact diagonalization on small system sizes and show that these kinds of states are not inconsistent with what you get if you tune parameters. But this is all in a Landau level picture. To do things realistically, what you want to do is try and solve this problem within the proper Hilbert space of twisted bilayer graphene. A year ago, I would have said this is impossible, but Mike's group, Mike Zalfeld's group has made remarkable advances in DMRG simulations. And we're now discussing with them whether these can be, we can study this axis of kind of excitonic quantum hold states more carefully within those calculations. Um, let me just flag that these kinds of states would be very hard to see in an experiment because of the fact, they'd be tricky to see an experiment because they have the same charge hole response as the fully polarized state. They have a distinct valley hole response and that you can see if you look in thermal transport. So in some sense, there's no experiment that now that can, other than the fact that it seems unlikely, they're completely consistent with a quantized anomalous hall conductance of one, if you work out the details of, the, of what the quantized anomalous hall conductance would be, because all you're doing is rearranging some neutral degrees of freedom while keep retaining the background quantized anomalous hall conductance. And I should say that a different perspective on this, looking at uh, energetics of one and two excitonic states was provided by Inti Soderman and his student a little while after we did. So just as a summary, I say part one, but I think because there were lots of questions and interesting discussions, I'm perfectly happy to stop here. I pointed out that Murray systems offer a, maybe a way to look at the quantum Hall effect of neutral particles. They're sort of adding to cold, at you know, cold atom systems were once the place to look if you wanted to see this quantum Hall effect of neutral particles because you could engineer synthetic gauge fields for neutral objects. I'm pointing out that the sort of special assignment of very curvatures in these Murray systems combined with strong electron interactions might allow you a way to look at these quantized Hall effects of neutral objects. And in the particular example of HBN uh, twisted by layer graphene, it's due to this particular assignment of value and churn number. And there are various other things that you can explore in the sort of, ex you know, once you have a bosons in a magnetic field, you can translate all the different quantized Hall states that have been proposed for that kind of uh, state of matter into this language and they give you some interesting pictures. Now, the realization or detection of these and realistic systems is very much a work in progress. I'm not going to say uh, anything. That I'm not I'm going to say that that's still a weakness of this work, uh, partly because the fact that realistically you expect that inter and intra value interactions are pretty close to each other, which is not as favorable as you might like. But the bandwidth tuning does seem potentially quite useful. So if you play around basically with bandwidth tuning, that seems to really favor partial value polarization. So that's quite possibly important. And the way to incorporate that is really, as I said, in trying to do realistic DMRG simulations of the sort of twisted bilayer graphene. And just in the last six months, the last three months, there have been real breakthroughs in going to large scale DMRG simulations, including now from Mike Zalatel's group, I think, are getting to the point where they can actually simulate spin and valley degrees of freedom as well, which is important to being able to do this. So what I've flagged here is the idea that thinking about the topology of the bands from which excitons form can point you towards new phenomena. So let me pause and take questions and then uh, I'll stop there unless people really want to hear about the second half because they were good questions in this stage. Yeah, I actually have a question, not surprisingly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is again about the quantitative aspects in you know, which I worry a lot about. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, let's, let's take a very simple system, just an electron gas, no topology, no charm, Absolutely. but there, are, there is an interaction Yep. And uh, as you tune the interaction, in that case, just by using density, yep. 
Yeah. You can make it more complicated. You can take two layers of electron gas, then you have a new right. parameter, the separation. Right. Let's just, you know, let's just forget about no value, just simple. Yeah. We know even that problem, there are many possible phases. Yeah. And, uh, and results depend very much on the kind of, kind of calculation one does, meaning, meaning yeah. you can get, you know, if you do Hartree Fock, you just get a ferromagnetic state at very high density. Yeah. When you do RPA, then you can get partially polarized and then you do something yeah. better. And, you know, all this quantum Monte Carlo, I mean, I know people swear by it, it doesn't give anything yeah. better. It just you know, it depends on how, what fits. Basically, if I know experiment is getting, has something, I can get it. Yeah. I can find a theory that will give it to me. I will be honest. Yeah. And nothing wrong with that. Uh, I think theory chasing good experiment is good. The reverse is not good. Reverse has, you know, <laughs> reverse has confirmation bias, but this is good. But how are you going to, how are you planning to settle it? You know, the only system where I have had luck, not I, the community, is fractional quantum hall. That's right. because of the magic of law yes. and correlation, right? That with six particle, you already get 99% yes. things right. So, so what's the plan here? Is it Mike's this new approach to MRG? I mean, he seems I think to be so. I think, I think the plan is, I like control. I'm with you completely on this point. So I would say, what I would try and hope to do is, you know, you know, my for me, I think a control calculation in this bilayer, these bilayer systems, really starting in this chiral limit that people identified is sort of useful because at least some of the quantum hall magic persists in that limit and perturb around that point and ask, can you see something controlled? I think is for me okay. maybe the so way. So maybe I missed something uh, yeah. uh, because I have not followed. If you do just pure mean field, you know, which will be hard to fork in the yeah. ordinary textbook sense. Yeah. But keep all the topology charred as it is. Yeah. What would you get? You'll get a phase diagram, right? I mean, if you yeah. just pure mean field, yeah. let's say assuming Coulomb or some model interaction. Absolutely. So I would say mean field is really this phase diagram, Shankar. So this is an actual mean field calculation. This is, I guess, what I did yeah. not appreciate. Not a twisted by layer, but I think this was an actual mean field calculation. That's why they have real numbers. So they did this. Yeah, but this is Hubbard type model, right? This is not like Coulomb interaction, correct? I think it was actually Coulomb. It was really okay. this. All right. So this uh, is in Mike's paper. Is that in Mike's paper? Mike's Where can I find it? It's dual gate screen, but what they did do was a little bit of a, a, a cheat. So this is in a lambda level regularized calculation, yeah. not a twisted bilayer calculation. Right. He talked to me about that. So that part I know, but I don't know this phase diagram. This he talked to me extensively about the screening part, but I don't know what he used it for. This calculation is done in a twisted by. It's not twisted bilayer. It's two lambda levels. With ah, okay. So okay. that, that's why this W over U. So it's not it's not honest for twisted bilayer. Right. So you what about know. doing this calculation twisted bilayer? Yeah, I think that's this is, a, you, hard, you know Hartree Fock using Coulomb interaction kind yeah. of thing we are doing here for yeah. twisted you get dichalcogenides. This, you get very much similar things. Uh, you think you'll get the same? Okay. You get very similar things, except this vortex lattice I think is harder to find. Okay. All right. So you get you know, basically you get these phases sort of show up. I think. All so, right. So now I see you have to do something better. Okay. I, I get. Also, the fully polarized insulator, at least within Hartree Fock, like all ferrom ferromagnets, are really stable in Hartree Fock, right? So yep. this guy just goes and eats up a lot of the phase diagram. It's very stable, mm -hmm. right? So we have the ability to do this, but then if you try and look for it, you don't actually see much other than the fully polarized insulator in the twisted bilayer limit, unless you tweak it quite a bit more. Right? You have to push around an angle and then there's other competing states that come in. So you do see these sort of pneumatic states, which are gapless, which are kind of metallic states, if you like, that is still. Yeah. So this state, for instance, is something that's sort of seen because it's just basically like the unpolarized metal in this language is like having the valley, the, one of these gapless states in a single valley. Yeah. Okay, I think you answered the question. I mean, you have still... Yeah. There's some understanding. You can, level you can take 10 more minutes if you want to go on because there are a lot of questions. So if in 10 more minutes, you can do something more, go ahead. I can, I can say something in the 10 minutes. If that's fine. I'll just say that, you know, again, uh, just to say what I'm talking about. Oh, is now, yeah, sorry. sorry. Oh, can I ask uh, one quick question? Uh, so, so in theory, what actually determines either is a spin polarized or versus a valley polarized? Oh, so the spin polarization is along for the right because the point is that at the level of spin polarization, it's a sort of spin is really a symmetry that's a, a very good approximation in these twisted bilayers. It's really just a label, right? So it's um, the spin polarization sort of comes in automatically just because of the fact that you've got flat bands. So it's the spin polarization is usually the last thing you worry about. In fact, most of my story, I could have just dropped spin except that it's there. I can just divide by two and drop spin for most of this argument. 
It's important when you're at the even fillings because then you tend to want to form spin singlet states for various reasons. But the valley is where the unique physics comes in. So it's sort of hidden in the fact of, you know, this two papers by Shankar and Jay, because the spin degree of freedom is something that is really, there spins in the same churn number sector, but there's no valley in the same churn number sector that's accessible to you. Right, the valley flip has to, at this filling, the valley has to flip churn number and that may fix it out as a very special thing. So within spin, if you like this full SU2 symmetry of spin, the fact that I called it up or down isn't particularly important. It could have been, you know, 30 degrees left, right? Because I get full SU2 symmetry. The valley, the churn number assignment of the valley, and this is the sort of thing that goes into the gap calculation that Trunker did, the churn number assignment of the valley sort of makes the valley intrinsically some kind of Ising degree of freedom. Even though naively you can rotate between the valleys, the fact that one valley is churn number one and the other is churn number minus one intrinsically peels away the valley as a special degree of freedom. Okay, okay, thank you. So again, this is something which maybe is uh, a little bit on the other direction. So I'm talking, uh, what I've been talking about so far is uh, twisted bilayer graphene, but there are other 2D materials. And in particular, there's WTE2, which is a layered TMD, which has very rich physics. For instance, in 3D, it's supposed to be a type two vial sunny metal. And if you look at individual monolayers, when you exfoliate it, it has this rather more complicated structure in contrast to other TMDs, which become hexagonal. When you take off a single layer of WTE2, it actually structurally, it really is more of an orthorhombic bill-on zone. So it's very different from say, uh, molybdenum disulfide and so on. And so, you know, there's an old prediction from Liang Fu's group that this should be a quantum spin hall insulator in its monolayer case. And in the University of Washington group, David Cobden and others have seen, uh, managed to do gate-induced superconductivity in this material. So the monolayer band structure of this material is quite complex, but it reduces to, at the near the Fermi energy, you can think of it as a two band model of uh, tungsten D orbitals and tellurium P orbitals. And this is one of those cases where again, competing scales are very much, uh, many scales compete because the interaction energy scale and the spin orbit scale are not that far off from each other. They're all roughly in the same ballpark. So in particular, People have argued that this system seems pretty insulating. Modulo bit physics at its edge, the bulk seems pretty insulating. I'll show you experiments that show that. But there's an argument in the community between whether you should think of this as just some spin orbit couple, spin orbit coupling induced single particle back gap, which people would call a band insulator scenario, versus a semi-metallic scenario where in the absence of interactions, even with spin orbit coupling, the system is semi-metallic. Um, you, and then you open up, a, a, even with spin orbit coupling, you open up electron and hole pockets. So the question is really, in the absence of interactions, is the system insulating with some spin orbit coupled gap or a semi-metal like this kind? And it turns out that depending on who you ask, you can get both answers. So um, because of the fact that it's some BFT calculation, you know, it depends on exactly what things you did. These scales are all very comparable and it depends on precisely what you choose to be a spin orbit scale, et cetera, et cetera. So details matter. So San Feng Wu's group uh, asked, how is the second scenario? Suppose that were true. And many subsequent DFTs suggested that this might be what, this is an example of one such DFT calculation. How could this possibly be consistent with there being an insulating bulk? So there were two competing explanations. One of them was that you could get just localized states of electrons and holes, and you could get a Coulomb gap from disorder. And another scenario was that you could have an excitonic insulator in the system. So these are sort of very uh, caricature-like pictures drawn from experimental paper, but the data is interesting. So what San Feng Wu's group did was try to really pull out bulk transport and try to get data that isn't polluted by edge physics because it's very hard if there are edge modes. So what they tried to do was take a sample like this and make contacts deep into the bulk away from any putative physical edge states. And so they made this thing, so they've got this encapsulated HBN and they etched only over here. So the point is that they've got this kind of sample and then they lay monolayer WT2 on top of it. So you can see that the contacts only are deep inside the bulk. And what they can also do is apply an out of plane displacement field. And what that can do is effectively, because the electrons and holes are at slight, you know, if you look at these uh, pictures that I do of the crystal structure, whoops. But if I look at the pictures of the crystal structure over here, um, you see that 
um, if the electron and pole orbitals are dominantly on tungsten versus tellurium sites, then they live in slightly, their locations are physically slightly distinct. So applying an out of plane field can essentially couple asymmetrically the electrons and holes, and that can be a very useful thing experimentally. So they did these experiments with two controls. They have a back gate so they can tune the overall density, but effectively they can also, uh, they have a top gate as well. So the difference between back and top gates essentially tunes what they call the displacement field because the monolayer has a finite thickness. And so what they see is if I look at this plot, what I'm showing you is back gate versus top gate. If you, sorry, if you move along this diagonal line, that's the line where effectively you're at charge neutrality. So moving vertically dopes the system away from the semi-metallic point. Moving horizontally somehow effectively transfers somehow the electron and hole, uh, changes the electron and hole bands, but keeps the total density at zero, physically. So, so, so your slide is not advancing. You are not, not a different slide. Oh, whoops, sorry. Let me just uh, try and stop sharing and then one second. Yeah. Can you see now? Sorry. Perfect. It should be back now. Can you see it now? Thanks so much. Uh, yes, yes. Now I see there. Yes. Uh huh. Okay. Now advancing again. Thank you. So you've got on this phase diagram, let me just repeat what I just said. You have a charge neutrality line. So if you move along this axis, you're just staying at zero uh, net electron count. Uh, and if you move vertically to this, you add, you're doping the system. But what you do over here is you're essentially shrinking the electron and the, uh, shrinking both electron and hole surfaces or expanding electron and hole surfaces. So if you like, you're pushing the, you're changing the shape of the Fermi surface as you move along this, this line. And if you move along this line, you're doping away from neutrality. And so what they saw, if you look at this picture, you see that there's a massive resistance near neutrality at relatively low displacement fields. So when you're uh, so then what you see is that there's an insulating state of charge neutrality. And what they're showing you is some multiple devices. So you can see that there's sort of device specificity here. But one of their devices has extremely high resistance at neutrality. And so what they did was let's try and see if we can say something non-trivial about this insulator. So what they looked at is looked at the low temperature transport. And what they see is that it's not consistent with the Coulomb gap type prediction in the sense that it doesn't have this classic e to the one over root p behavior. And in, also it's very sensitive to this application of a displacement field. And so they felt that that was something that was really tied to the fact that it cares about the electron and hole like Fermi surfaces. A second point that they did was they asked, can we look at the Hall effect in this insulator near neutrality? So they parked themselves near the neutrality point and looked at the Hall insulator. So the dashed lines are what you expect if you just had some kind of band insulating scenario, you should expect to see some, you know, when you park the chemical potential, the gap, you go through, you know, you stop filling electrons and then you go through and then start filling holes. And so you should just see the smooth evolution. And instead they saw this very non-trivial pattern in the hole trace. So they concluded that this was something that was reasonably consistent with there being some kind of electron, electron interactions and an um, insulating state. Can you go back to that last slide? I mean, yes. it may very well be what they are saying is going on. Yes. Uh, uh, but concluding something about uh, a power law in square root with a factor of four variation in yeah. temperature, you, you can get anything you want there, I can tell you. I agree. Okay. Uh, I don't think, I think of this as more interesting data. I should have probably flagged that. I think they, they did a lot of work to rule out this. Yeah. Long if aspect. you didn't show this, I would not have been persuaded there is anything here. So now yeah. I'm persuaded there may be something here. Yeah. I think this is much more persuasive. I agree with you. I, I wasn't particularly happy with fitting with so, so few decades of a power law fit is not something that I would be particularly comfortable with. I showed it. As, it's it's not a decade. You can see it's a factor of four. That's it. It's yeah. not even one decade. Yeah, I'm saying not even one decade. Right. That's mm -hmm. what I mean. Sorry, uh, not a decade. But I think the point is this, I think, was kind of nice because this is really saying if I took the semi metal, if I took the band insulator that people produce from BFP seriously and tried to tell you what the Hall effect would be, this is the green curve. And you see that you deviate quite strongly from that. So at least suggests that that band insulating scenario is probably not quite there. It doesn't quite get it. And that's the statement I'm making. Okay. So in some sense, this is very close to a problem that was explored by Halpern and Rice in that it's uh, tucked away in their monster 75 page paper. Uh, you can look at a case when you have two electron pockets and a hole pocket. So, you know, if you draw the shapes of these things, they're like this with some very small, uh, with some particular incommensurate wave vector that links these pockets. 
But when Halpern and Rice were doing it, spin, this was still in the days when spin orbit was a you know, correction that we threw out. And because there's no spin orbit, they also assumed that the block functions were completely smooth everywhere across this Fermi surface and this Fermi surface. But here, we know that we're quite close to some kind of band inversion that was happening in the band structure. Whatever is happening in the semi-metallic problem, these block functions are going to be varying. We don't know whether or not they play a role in tungsten ditellurite. So our goal was to ask, do we need to care or can we just take these old simple parabolic band approximation and do that? And the reason to do this is whether or not you care about those details actually affects uh, the kind of ordered state that you predict and therefore the collective modes that you get. So you can do some work. You can take a page out of their book, but be a bit careful. So what you can do is uh, for aficionados of exciton condensation, so I'm sure this will be familiar with Shankar. Uh, to Shankar, this is the uh, picture is very similar to the uh, what people call the dominant term approximation. The dominant term approximation, by other words, is saying, forget about everything except sort of effectively the leading parabolic band structure. And in that picture, you have you can take a trial wave function of this form where you say um, an electron for some particular spin forms a linear combination with some superposition of uh, a whole of some particular spin, sorry, forms a linear combination with electrons of some particular valley superposition and some spin superposition. So there's some uh, matrix here that characterizes that. And you can show that that matrix essentially is parameterizing the space U4 just by counting parameters. And so the idea is that what you're doing is taking trial states of this form and asking how do corrections about the pro uh, this leading approximation lift the symmetry. So it's sort of saying elevate the symmetry and ask what the dominant anisotropies are. And this is very similar in spirit to how people think about complicated quantum Hall ferromagnets and bio graphene and bilayers and so on. And in our particular case, we focused on how interactions lifted this band topology. So you get a hartree fock phase diagram, which says that if I ramp interaction, so this is very much like what Chunker was hoping we would do, I would show you for um, bilayer, uh, for Moiré graphene. Um, so you get a phase diagram where you can find two dominant competing gap states. One of them is what I'll call a spin density wave state, where the electrons of spin up form superpositions with poles from both valleys, some linear combination of spin down and vice versa. But away from, you have an intervening limit where you get a topological exciton insulator, which you can compute by some indices. And if you ramp up interactions to what was believed to be the physical scale of interactions from DFT type calculations, what you find is that you get a spin spiral state where essentially you also valley polarize as you go. So you say that electrons of, uh, so you, the holes of spin down pair with electrons of spin up, but only in one valley. And holes of spin up pair with electrons of spin down in the other valley. So it's a, quite a complicated trial state. Um, so we can sort of justify the competition between these states in some toy, in some picture of Dirac points. I won't go into the details. The, the basic picture is, if you look in the spin spiral, essentially what you find is in the for the spin spiral state, you're in a limit when there's essentially no or the Dirac point is very far from the states that are participating in the pairing. So what I've shown you is the Dirac point in momentum space. The reason the Dirac point is not at the bo uh, bottom of the band is because this is one of those cases. Uh, which were discovered, discussed about five, six years ago, what are called tilted Dirac cones. The Dirac cone can be moved in energy space or it can be moved in momentum space. So what's happening is all the Berry curvature is happening in states somewhere over here. But by the time you get to the manifold of filled bands, there's no, not much Berry curvature fluctuation anymore. So in this picture, the form factors are completely boring. And if you look at these states that I produced um, in the spin density wave state, there's actually some intervalley coherence. And that intervalley coherence triggers a vestigial charge density wave. But if you don't have any uh, special features in the form factor, that costs an enormous amount of energy. And so you're forced into this state where you have a spin spiral state of this kind. So you don't have any intervalley coherence. If you're in the spin density wave, you can actually show by looking at how the band structure evolves. So what you're doing is asking how do interactions feed into the, band, the effective band structure of the bands that go into pairing. You find that actually you have significant uh, very curvature, a significant variation of the orbital wave functions you wind across. So the interactions actually care about the fact that you have some kind of underlying topological, uh, topological winding in the bands. And so what that gives you is that you, you're allowed to have an S spin density wave because the cost of triggering um, any kind of charge modulation from that spin density wave is 
uh, minimum. And so you can sort of do a la basically build a Landau theory that has these ingredients. And so, Sid, Sid, you should wrap up because yeah, I have to go yeah. soon. I don't like leaving before the talk is over. Okay, okay I'm just going to wrap up by saying nothing more than saying if you look at the these things, great distinct collective modes. And so, there's actually a difference in the collective mode spectra. So, the idea is that you might be able to see it. And in particular, uh, in the spin spiral, there's a sharp prediction that you should see a charge density wave only if you put on a magnetic field to break spin rotation symmetry. In the absence of that, Spin rotation is a good symmetry of this problem to very good approximation. And you can show that the spin spiral, which seems to be the, uh, the, the relevant state in this problem, cannot have any charge modulation. So you can actually show that there's a field tuned charge density wave in this system. So let me just close. Um, the, the, only, the reason we were motivated to do this was that this is also an experiment where there's one, robust quantum oscillations in what seems to be an insulating state. So what we were trying to do was understand whether any of these B equals zero ground states can explain this Landau quantization. And sadly, to date, I don't have a story to explain that. So let me close the summary of part two and thank you for letting me go a little bit over. And uh, sorry for going about 10 minutes over. Uh, no, no, you had a lot of questions. No, no reason to be sorry. You know, no. our, our in-person talk at CMTC is right. Landau or Bell Lab type talk. We have done time. Right. time. So, but I have to ask a question first. I asked many questions because I really got to go. So my question is, will sound almost philosophical, but yeah. anybody who knows me knows that I do right. philosophy only my part time. So the question is that, you know, fractional quantum Hall effect was discovered roughly 40 years ago. Yes. And I was roughly Sid's age. I mean, I'm kind of, I'm kind of being slightly uh, incorrect. And it was immediately clear to us that this is a subject that will remain rich for a very long time. Of course, we did not know all the richness. It turned out to be richer than I at least had any reason to believe. But it was clear that finally we stumbled upon something which yeah. is truly interacting, meaning it's non perturbative right? Right. So, and, and it's still giving us things as we know. Now, I have a very good feeling about this whole 2D more, 2D TMD and things like that, which is why I'm working on it now as a young physicist, you know, at a stage where yeah. you want to work on interesting things for, you know, next 30 years. Do you think these systems will last 30 years? Because I think it may because of all these competing scales. Yeah. So I think, Shankar, I think they will. I think the interesting thing there is I think, I'm, you know, full disclosure, I'm trying to convince Oxford that this is an area that we should be investing experimental money in getting sure, really good of course, of course. Without experiment, and nothing would happen, right? I mean, Lauren Pfeiffer, Lauren Pfeiffer single-handedly fractional quantum Hall, right? I mean, so. Exactly. I think why I think it's really interesting is I think of it as democratizing some of fractional quantum Hall. So if you think exactly. about it, that came out of fractional right. quantum you, Hall. You and I agree. That's exactly my view also. So anybody can do it. Yeah. Is yeah. If anybody, anybody can do it. You are limited just by your imagination. And mm -hmm. there are so many phases, you likely discover your own phase because exactly. small change will create a new phase. The band is completely flat. Slight change will make one. So yeah. you and I agree. Good, good. I, I gotta go on a very nice talk. Uh, you, let you. others ask questions. Please do send okay. me what you promised to send me, okay? Will do. I'll send you the list of reps. Yeah, will do. Thanks, Shankar. Okay, uh, is there any other question? So if not, maybe I can ask a question. It's probably, um, yeah. So, so I know that uh, experimentally it has uh, observed this uh, quantum oscillation in uh, this material you mentioned, but yeah. I also recall that uh, in the Indian arsenic like guiding antimony, yeah. uh, they also observe yeah. a quantum oscillation. And surprisingly, yeah. both of material yeah. are, are argued to be the quantum spin hole candidate. Yeah. So I'm curious, if do you have any comment? I don't think I have a statement that links it to quantum spin hole, but I can say something about this indium mass arsenide kind of story. That was a narrow gap insulator, right? So the thing is, in an insulating state, there is a prediction, a beautiful piece of work by Nigel Cooper and Johannes Nolle, that basically, you know, if you want to modernize the understanding, you can think of it as a kind of, you can frame it in terms of instanton corrections to the lambda level energies that give you oscillations even in the presence of an insulating gap. Now, if you look at their experiment, their, their predictions, they would say you would see a gap in all quantity. You would see transport in, uh, you would see oscillations both in conductivity and in uh, magnetization. The key thing there though, is that the gap in conductivity would be sensitive, the, the oscillations in conductivity would be sensitive to the gap. So if you come down in temperature, you should see activated behavior in the conductivity oscillations. You should see 
just non Lipschitz Kosevich, non activated behavior in the uh, magnetization oscillations, because the magnetization is just some bulk phenomenon. It doesn't require stuff to traverse the gap. That would be the crisp prediction there. If you look at Sanfeng's data, you do not actually see very clearly that there's, a, you know, so there's a very nice paper by Patrick Lee that does exactly this, that says, let's imagine how you could get resistivity in an insulator. But I think my understanding of that is it would still give you activated behavior because all it's, what it basically says is there's a gap, the gap oscillates, and that's what you're seeing. Uh, but the problem is that that would require, as you look in temperature, you would see very drastic temperature dependence. That seems to not be the case that we can see. So it somehow is a bit weird because you somehow need some mechanism for subgap conductivity. So we tried to get it. I have some scenario that I can think of. We tried to get it out of a charge density wave kind of scenario. You could imagine maybe there's a sliding charge density wave whose dissipation is changing in the field, but that's a very contrived scenario. Sendo has a different scenario, which has to do with some kind of effective um, excitonic, uh, some, some kind of neutral Fermi surface of composite excitons that then have an oscillation. That's a nice story as well. But again, there it's hard to, there's no concrete, it's a beautiful scenario and could give you the oscillations that are consistent with this, but there isn't a concrete calculation that I've seen done that gives you that answer. So it's a story that says, at least in one case, the question I think is really that one has to answer is, what is the real careful temperature dependence of the oscillating resistivity? And there's an extra wrinkle, which is Kim Pai Ma at, uh, at Cornell has suggested that actually this could do with some rather delicate effect of what's happening of screening in the gate versus uh, which is oscillating in the magnetic field that you have, which seems very strange. I mean, the, 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 I don't know an explanation of that. I mean, the real striking thing in Sun Feng's experiments is that you get mega ohm type resistance, you know, gigantic resistances, right? Um, but the oscillation and the mobility that you would assert, if you just take those resistances, they're huge. They're like way high for insulators, right? Even for insulators, they're like really, really insulated. But then if you look at the field at which you see the onset of quantum, so let's look at the field at which you see the onset of quantum oscillation. Translate that field to a mobility because you can say, ah, I know something about what kind of disorder that they have you have an insanely high mobility. So, because the field is so low at which you start seeing the onset of oscillations. So that particular juxtaposition of high mobility, but very low, uh, you know, very high resistivity, but also high mobility seems to be essentially new. And I don't have an answer in that setting, if that makes sense. So I guess the uh, quantum spin hole is just a coincident feature for both of them, I guess. In this picture, the quantum spin hole isn't part of the problem in the sense that it's quite far off from the problem because you know, you're contacting straight to the bulk, so you're not sensitive to the edge modes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see. Okay, so is there any other question? Okay, if not, let's thank uh, Sid again. And thanks for staying for Thank you, Sid. Very nice talk. Uh, let I me stop sharing. Yeah. Okay.